Hi everyone, I'm Pete Tigers and this is the Fly Culture Podcast. I hope you're all doing well and I hope you're all being safe at the moment. This is another podcast that I was been really keen to do um, and just talk about fishing and talk about um, the rods we like fishing with as well. And it's that coming in if we get back to some form of normality that it's this time of year that I start to think about my fishing and going through the fly boxes and perhaps treating myself to a new piece of tackle for the new season. And I thought it would be really interesting to speak to a couple of friends, um, they're rod builders, and I thought it would be interesting to get an insight really an insight but not without being too technical just really talking about why we like fishing these particular rods and both of them have experience in building um, primarily bamboo but carbon rods and fiberglass rods as well so I hope you'll enjoy this um, conversation that we're having um, my two guests today um, firstly I have Luke Bannister who is based in Cornwall he builds bamboo, glass and graphite rods. He's a guide, a fly casting instructor who fishes the West Country and is seen around mid Wales as well. I also have Adam Rawson from Bristol. He's a passionate angler who fishes the small, re small streams around the area. He also builds on carbon, glass and bamboo too. Gents, it's great to have you here. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me today. How are you doing? Are you good, Luke? Good. Yeah, good. Thanks, Pete. It's strange times, which I think everyone's feeling it a bit. But uh, for me, it's been okay. You know, that, the thing of working on the own in a workshop, sort of what I do anyhow, you know. So, yeah, it's been okay. I know when we spoke on the phone the other day that you said usually January, February, you sort of go into hibernation in your workshop. And so you don't feel like you're missing out on fishing or anything right now. No, this January, February are pretty, yeah, dire months anyway. You know, just the weather. Normally, I don't fish after December anyway. It's sort of I quite like to have a complete break from the from the fishing. So uh, yeah, January, February, good time to just to get in the workshop and get stuff done, really. And thankfully, got a reason that stuff to be doing. Fantastic. Adam, it's great to have you here too. And um, how's things been for you? Are you able to hit some of those small streams? Because I know, I, sh I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, but I've been really lucky to fish some of those streams around where you live. And they are amazing. And they do have some grayling in them too. So have you been able to, are you near enough to be able to get out and do some fishing? Thanks. Yes, yeah, it's great to be here. Um, so it's my local is probably 10 miles away um so it's sort of a 15 minute drive because uh, it's mostly motorway so i haven't been out um i probably could do i i, I mean stay local what does that mean no one really knows do they um but luckily i haven't been tempted because the the rain's just been putting the levels up and down anyway so obviously we've had snow so all the snow melt's gone in now. It's not happening anytime soon. But um, yeah, it's a shame because I do like getting out normally with a glass rod, actually, and uh, getting some getting some grill in. But yeah, one of those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's one. Of, it, like I say, those hidden away little streams, and I know Luke feels the same. It's not always the big name rivers that fascinate and interest me. It's finding those little hidden away places and I know Luke showed me one many years ago which I kept very quiet about and have continued to keep quiet about as well and we're not going to mention the name but those little places that nobody knows about and or you think nobody knows about and then you might see somebody else there but um, those little streams are really special aren't they and it, it, it is nice to find those and and I guess the materials we're talking about today although we'll touch on still water as well the materials generally that we're talking about um, when it comes to glass as Adam mentioned and bamboo as well lend themselves well to that those forms of fishing don't they Luke? They do yeah is to be honest I think one of the reasons I really got into the cane was it just works so well on small streams. You know, that really is its sweet spot. At the time, when I first started getting into it, carbon rods were just too stiff. You know, they there weren't any decent 
small stream rods. You know, there were sort of ones that were okay, but actually cane works, you know, whereas at the time carbon was a bit of a compromise, you know, whereas now, I don't know what Adam thinks, but to be honest, I sort of look at it now and think if I was getting into small stream fishing now, would I actually get into cut cane? Because the the alternatives are that good, you know, glass, some of the glass stuff now is just superb, you know, it is, as, mm, I don't want to say too much, but it's, it's as good as cane, you know, in the way that it works and feels. So it's a, it's an interesting one. I'd say a while ago, cane was definitely head and shoulders, the best stuff for small streams, whereas now, and even the carbon, you know, some of the, the mixes now that they're doing, and just the understanding of getting tapers to work, there's there's very good alternatives to cane and a lot cheaper, you know. So <laughs> it's an interesting, yeah, an interesting time. And especially as rod makers, because now we can, the choice of materials, we've got a, a huge choice in what we can use, you know, whereas the same a while ago, if you wanted a really nice small stream rod, cane. Whereas now it's, there's a lot more sort of choice in materials. That's a really interesting point. And Adam, um, Luke touched on um, glass there. And I'd always been so nervous of glass in the sense of, um, I tried one years ago and it was absolutely terrible and it put me off. <laughs> but there are so many now, the, the introduction, I guess, of fast glass has revolutionized or or brought a second coming for for um glass rods as well and also i guess in some respects um they may be a little bit more robust than than bamboo and you wouldn't need to worry perhaps in quite the same way are you seeing that a uh, uh, the similar sort of thing that luke's saying that the the drift obviously into bamboo but also into glass rods too Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt that, I mean, and when you look at it, when you look at the three materials, you've got bamboo, the glass and the carbon or graphite, that essentially we're talking about two different versions of each of those things, because you've got the e-glass, which is the old stuff, the stuff that you're on about that's generally wasn't very nice to use. It was just like that. <laughs> um, and then you've got the fast glass, which is the modern stuff. With carbon, you've got the old stuff that was pretty much every rod was virtually just fast action, um, really stiff, all in the tip. So it didn't really lend itself, like Luke was saying, to small streams. And then you've got the more modern stuff where they've kind of slowed everything down, um, which works better. Um, and then for bamboo, you've got the old vintage stuff, which is heavy. Generally, this is with some exceptions, but it's heavy and again very slow and then the more modern bamboo rods um the response time is a bit quicker um but still having that sort of relaxed feel um for the small streams but definitely there's been a shift towards glass um probably for the the, the cost saving um how they perform like luke says they are closer to bamboo um I I don't really agree with the um, the strength sort of delicate nature of bamboo. Um, I always say to customers, I've I've never snapped a bamboo rod, but I've snapped plenty of carbon rods, um, and I don't look after them. I'm still crawling through brambles with them and stuff, and walking into trees. But they just tend to give rather than snap, in my experience. Um, but yeah, fiberglass is definitely a tougher. A tougher material definitely than cut more tough than carbon because it's not as brittle um yeah but yeah it's um it's strange how it's shifted back to, to that sort of way but they're definitely two different materials like the old glass and the new glass i can yeah. say yeah that's what's made me really interested in them i have to say and and i'm gonna dip my toe at some stage i can feel it's coming so um I'm looking forward to that. Um, it was interesting in the carbon that you talked about um, that the move away from those stiffer rods, do you think that's a function of trend or do you think it's a function of design 
in the sense of you can only take a rod so far in its how stiff you're going to actually make it. And I guess if it's becoming stiffer and stiffer, then as a result of that, it could be perhaps a little bit more brittle. And so do you think that there has been a shift away from that stiffer action rod for a number of reasons um but also the anglers perhaps they're listening i'm sure they do to anglers as well in that sense that they don't really want these super stiff clubs to cast a fly line what what do you feel about that luke it's it's probably a combination of all of them really i think there's a definitely uh probably a much better understanding of design now and also casting you know, you look at the ca- the standard of casting now in everyone is a lot better. You know, it's, mm-hmm. yeah, people are definitely have a more under, better understanding of what's going on. And I think the manufacturers, I think they're making better rods, to be honest, you know, and an understanding of the material as well. I think initially it was, we can make this really stiff. Let's make it really stiff. And so that was where it was just who could make the stiffest rod, which okay, well, even on reservoirs, it's not ideal. But stiff rods were okay because that's what everyone thought you needed. But then as over time, as it evolved and people started reasoning, well, no, actually, you need to be able to load the thing to get it to cast properly. So that then there was also sort of the, the development started and uh, they slowly became... Hmm, more manageable really sort of soft they bent more you know sort of because there's this the terms that you quite often hear is a sort of stiff and fast i think initially it was the the drive was for stiffer rods then it was for faster rods and then it was for sort of rods that would bend deeper you know more friendly fishing rods basically because it i'm sure we've all done it with fast or stiff rods is cracking fish off if you're fishing short distance with a stiff rod. It's okay if you're hooking small fish, but it's when you hook that, you know, that big grayling that takes them deep down and everything's solid and you lift into it a bit sharply and you just, you know exactly what's happened. And it's just that's the thing, whereas a softer rod, glass is brilliant for it, you know, is it just bends deeper, you know, so you can just load on the fish and you're into them really so it's yeah i think it's it's been a long process but i think it's it's a combination of people's understanding the manufacturers definitely getting better and sort of understanding what i'll say whether they're leading what people want or people wanting it and then manufacturers following in behind i couldn't say but it's a they're definitely rods now are an awful lot better than they were you know, even yeah. we've had conversations, I'm sure, with you. I know I've had it with Gerald. Is these days it's very difficult indeed to buy a bad fishing rod. You know, even the really cheap stuff is is okay, and the the cheaper end of the manufacturers, you know, Vision that sort of stuff, they're nice fishing rods. You know, for the money, for what you get in they are really nice fishing rods, you know, so I think there's a, yeah, a definitely a move in the right direction. Yeah. Adam, do you think it's been also technologies played a part in that, in that it seems as though resins, to me at least, that they're using on rods seem to have leapt on a fair bit over the last five years or so with nano and everything else, kinetic and everything else that has happened do you think that and technology helping design rods more efficiently do you think that's part of it perhaps yeah i mean i haven't really been involved in certainly in the carbon side of designing tapers so much um but definitely i mean technology comes on doesn't it the the cloth quality as well, I'm sure, plays a part. All these different terms, nano and and everything, I couldn't honestly tell you what a lot of them mean. Um, and if all the different things, whether they are different or whether they're the, just the same, but it's just sort of a market employee a little bit. Um, but but yeah, it, it's, it's bound to have played a difference. Um, 
just the same way it has with with glass i mean i think the fast glass stuff you're talking about is it's sort of from a military background um where it's come from whereas the original e-glass was sort of an electrical application um so it's not really surprising that it's come on so much and technology of course has has played a, a part in that for sure yeah so we're going down the glass hole at the moment we're going to pull it back a little bit as well back to the carbon for a second and luke you built me a nine and a half foot four weight really um uh carbon rod which i'm absolutely thrilled with and fish pretty much exclusively now um is it something that you've seen that there has been a sort of a change that people like myself and and I'm sure lots of other people I'm interested in rods that are slightly different from the norm yet I can use for a variety of applications do you think have you seen this sort of move towards longer lighter line rods yeah to a degree I I think the thing now is there's that much choice that people can pretty well have whatever they want the the longer log rod stuff is there's definitely more of it more interest in it i think the versatility of it there's there seems to be a definite interest increase in interest in the sort of spiders wet fly fishing yeah sort of more traditional styles which are ever so effective longer rods definitely sort of help with that and the thing with a longer rod is actually they're sort of they're really useful for short line it's a really versatile rod you know so you can fish the short line nymphing stuff works really well the the thing with long rods is the line control you know how well how well it manages line dry and wet you know you're fishing at a bit of distance just the amount of line that you can sort of move and just stay in contact with the flies really so I, yeah i'd say the the longer rods is definitely more interest in it and it thinking about it now it's probably i'm probably doing more longer rods than i am shorter rods you know so the the six foot rods which a while ago i'd say were a really popular small stream rod which i was never a huge fan of i sort of seven foot i think you can fish anywhere with a seven foot rod a six footer they're, they're nice things and they're really i'd say they're sort of really specific and if they're if you use them in their sweet spot absolutely fantastic but as soon as you sort of go out of that they they become much more limited so it's I don't want to use the term one trick pony, but they're sort of a quite a specific rod. Whereas a longer one, you can use them an awful lot like that nine foot six, because I've got one as well, <laughs> is uh, I think Dartmoor, that, you know, a longer rod on Dartmoor, those sort of upland streams, absolutely yeah, brilliant thing. And also on the bigger rivers, you know, on the X where we fished. Yes, yeah, absolutely perfect. So it's yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there is a move to the longer rod, but again, from the cane point of view, there's you know the small, the seven foot is probably the most popular sort of thing in terms of that you know the small stream fishing. But as soon as you go anything a little bit bigger than small stream, the longer rods, yeah, definitely. Adam, um, I'm thinking about the streams that you fish and a lot smaller and those smaller and we're talking in the context of carbon still at the moment and you know as luke says and I, I have to agree that i don't own anything shorter than a seven footer but i know there are situations where people do like a, a, a again as luke says a really really short rod but length it seems as though it's relatively easy to get a rod for small streams in a variety of lengths what about line weights though if i say i wanted a one or a two weight or something like that is that possible is that easy to sort of source that sort of thing 
it's definitely becoming easier. Um, to be perfectly honest, I, I don't really do that much carbon anymore. Um, especially in those lower, lower line rate weights, and especially from my own sort of fishing, if I'm looking for a rod in that sort of range, I'm not looking towards carbon anyway, just because that's, I suppose it's my bias. Um, I, I haven't really tried any of the, the new carbon in that that sort of um, that sort of range, um, but definitely it's there. It's it's available. Whereas when I first started fly fishing, when I was twenty, um, you it didn't seem to be there at all. That sort of it wasn't even talked about. I'm not sure if it existed, but I certainly didn't hear of it. It was straight in with sort of a a four weight was pretty much as low as it would go, and. Um, yeah, on the, you know the small streams I'm fishing. It, I was fishing like a nine foot four weight on it when I first started because I didn't really have much of a clue when it was it was horrible, honestly. Um, which is why I started looking towards the shorter stuff. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely there and available now. Whereas and and even the fly lines as well. There's more and more companies are putting out these um, lower lower lines. Um, even zero weights you can buy now. Um, yeah, it, it's it's definitely a swing towards that sort of style. Um, like you say, whether it's the manufacturers leading us or whether we're leading them, it's, um, that's up for discussion. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that I remember the first river rod I had was an eight foot for a five because you couldn't get any lighter. And that's changed. And then subsequently, and I still fish it actually in really small streams and um, is a one weight, which I bought, it must be 20 years ago. It's a bit of a collector's item, but it's interesting what Adam said about the fly lines, because I think that's a, something nice to come on to as well. Um, because for the small stream stuff, I'm, I'm sort of more veering towards, and I know, um, Luke, you're more so this way that to cast a, a dry fly um, most of the time. And when I first started fishing in Devon, that's all you did. And it, you could fish, you know, the whole season that way. Sometimes it's not quite that way now, but largely, yes, they'll, they'll still come up. No, I've always felt that a rod like a two weight for just my dry fly fishing on a small stream and a four weight if I wanted to throw a duo. But coming back to the fly lines, um, Luke, they've they've really revolutionized really um, small stream fishing, haven't they? And the ability to load the rod quickly with minimum force cast. That's been quite a big change as well that we've seen, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's one of the the really big changes as well as the sort of the rods the lines have changed massively you know is yeah made a big difference and just the the variety in tapers you know before it was you get a double taper and that was a lot you know whereas now there's there is a big sort of variety in again i think the understanding of line you know tapers how they work and yeah certainly massive improvements it's yeah it's an interesting the line weights is always an interesting one for me is i think if you go below three you're getting into a very sort of narrow area of useful weight you know again is lovely uh, there's a garrison well we're going to garrison 201 three weight absolutely lovely dry fly rod you know just that on a nice warm evening in the summer, not too much breeze, absolutely superb. But it's that's what it's really good at. The you know the some of the other stuff or the other lines that go lighter. Personally, I think they're all three weights, or they're sort of around the three weight with a different number written on the box, sort of thing. Is you just look at how the the grain weights go down. You know, it's uh, is it. 20, 20 grains of line weight, I think it is. So as you know, yeah. as you go down, it's like well, thirty feet of line. You you're going to get very light to get you know one weight. I've no, I've never actually weighed a one weight normally. I actually weigh fly lines. I've never bought one, so I haven't weighed it. But it'd be interesting to know how heavy 
a one way is in relation to the sort of the actual line ratings and it's what they can you know what you can do with them that's my sort of i think most of my fishing is with a four weight because it's just such a versatile line you know is it no problems with sort of light presentation but also if you want to put a bigger bushier fly on because we do get you know on the small streams which is a it's a real tricky situation a mayfly act on a small string you know that's it can be really good fishing but if you get a bit of a breeze on a light line in a small stream poor you you have to sort of your casting has to be pretty reasonable to get the whole lot to turn over nicely and with a, a really light line you're going to be thinking more or i'd be thinking more about my casting than my fishing whereas i know with a four weight it's going to go you know it's going to turn over and it's not going to be every presentation so i don't know what adam's you have you got a go-to sort of line weight or do you tend to sort of chop and change yeah so i'm the same as you i don't go yeah generally i don't go lower than a three weight um but again uh, it's all on bamboo for me so oh. um yeah three weight is definitely my my lowest um four like you say anything from sort of six and a half foot up to probably seven and a half foot in a four is just yeah. perfect yeah that's um, a sweet spot, isn't it? for me yeah i i do see the, the the appeal of lower line weights depending on where you are on, on sort of i know there's some guys in cornwall that i've sold rods to and lower line rate weights and they're fishing tiny little streams for sort of brown yeah. trout that don't get much bigger than this um and i can see the appeal for that if that's your local fishing but for me where i fish um it's possible to catch like 14 inch trout I, i'm not in in a small stream i'm not really interested in scaling my tackle down because there's too many true roots oh. um so yeah. yeah i can see interesting the, the ultra light stuff i can see all the ultra light fly line not so much leaders but the ultralight fly lines you can see the the appeal just a pure simplicity of it you know because those those ultra thin fly lines a lot of them don't actually really use leaders you know they, they're pretty much going to tip it or just tipping the, the tip it stepping the tippet down once and that's your setup well that's a really easy you know which simple <laughs> Simple is good, so I can I can certainly see the appeal of it. But personally, my fishing is I'll chop and change that much in the course of my day's fishing. A light line sort of limits. I feel a bit limited if I've got a three weight line on. If I'm if I'm going to fish a three weight line, it'll be a nice evening or a nice day in the summer that I'm going to take two or one out and just have a few or a really nice session on a dry fly, maybe an unweighted, you know, small spiders. But that would be, I would be going specifically for that. If I'm just going fishing, it'll be a four weight because I'll be fishing a nymph. I mean, quite often on pools, I'll fish a dry in the tail as I go up into the middle section of the pool, I'll put a nymph on. And then as I go up into the faster water, I'll change to a dry again. You know, and really, I want my fly line set up to be able to sort of do everything reasonably well, which a full weight it does. You know, it's just a, a really versatile line. There's some good points there, interesting points as well. I, I guess I, I've fished that one for 20 plus years, and I use it in the sense of I'm just going fishing and I'm going to throw a dry where I think I'm going to, and you know, some of the streams I fish, um, Luke, the smaller ones. Um, and it worked really well for me on there. And it's when I, I guess I'm not motive, not that I ever am, but not motivated by catching numbers of fish. I just want to fish that pattern or combination of patterns. And I, I found certainly with the early and that was a very old line that I fished on there. Latterly, I put a new um, line on 
one of the more modern ones. And yes, it does bend the rod a little bit more deeply, um, as you say, so perhaps it is a little bit heavier. I've never weighed the line, so I don't really know. Um, but I found that I could um, hang a relatively light nymph off there as well, should I needed to. It did obviously affect performance of the rod a little bit, but I kind of just enjoyed, and I, th I guess part of me thought, well, it's kind of cool saying you're fishing um, a one way. I was fishing it for appropriate sized fish as well. So um, my friend Perry, where I fish his, I fish a little two weight and we just fish dry flies. Um, and I really enjoy that. But yeah, I, I, I like the idea of, as you say, Luke, when it's a summer's evening or whatever it is, and you say, yep, I'm going to get this one down and fish this one and and enjoy that one and i i think that's one of the nice things about this conversation that we're covering so many bases on different options that perhaps people do explore themselves and it, this resonates with them or it's something they've been considering and while i've been doing this and the magazine that i'm getting the sense from people that they are looking and one of the words again that i think both of you used is more simple and more stripped back and that's a term i've used previously as well and i wonder if that's why some of these things are coming into vogue a little bit more it may be that we can't fish as well so we've got a little bit more time to think about those things just a little bit more and i know last lockdown i had your rods out and i was casting them and i was right this line that line and i really enjoyed that and and that was part of it as well so i do wonder if there's a little bit of that too um we're going to come on to the glass rods as well and that's been quite a big renaissance and a couple of the motivators i think for that may have been cameron's fiberglass manifesto what cole was doing with epic rods down in new zealand as well Adam, do you see those as some of the driving forces behind the second coming, I guess, alongside the um, S -glass, uh, F glass being more available? Do you think they were some of the motivations or do you think there's a little bit more with that as well? Definitely. I, th I think, like you say, the Fiber Clouds Manifesto, I remember, I don't know, it must be a decade ago now, maybe, um, on Instagram, definitely following um, the fiberglass manifesto and turning out all these things, um, posts about and blog posts as well about um, all the rods available, def certainly in America. And they made it seem so appealing. Um, and, and with that, the availability of them seems to have taken off as well. Um, and it, it's not just them saying, look at these colorful rods that they're, they're, they're good they're really nice to use they're not like the old glass um you mentioned epic rods and cts as well um they're making brilliant brilliant rods and um, they're kind of bridging that gap even more between carbon and cane um and it's it's less expensive it's just it's it's, it's good stuff <laughs> I don't really know what else to say about it, but yeah, definitely they are the driving forces behind it. I, I would definitely agree with that. Cool. Luke, do you think um, it was interesting what Adam just said there about um, the rods and finding the fiberglass manifesto on Instagram? Do you think that tied in with the growth of Instagram and social media and it, it happened to, there was a little sort of, whisper that grew louder and was allowed to grow louder because of um, social media. Do you think that was part of it to a degree as well? It certainly helped spread the word. But I, again, I think the manifesto, that definitely sort of, you can call it mainstream, but it definitely got the word about, you know, it, that was sort of, people started sort of coming across it. I think one of the things that helped with the glass was Kane had sort of come back. Kane was it's getting to the stage where it was no longer this obscure thing, you know, it was it's not mainstream, but Kane was definitely more popular. And I think, purely an opinion, is that people, it put in people's minds the idea that 
carbon fiber wasn't the only thing that you could make a fishing rod out of. Before, you know, a while ago, quite a while ago, I should think in this country, the vast majority of people who fished, the only material you could make a fishing rod out of was carbon fiber. That's, you know, that was their only experience and didn't really consider it or like their granddads might have used a cane rod. But as far as they were concerned, if you wanted a fishing rod, you had a carbon fiber one. I think cane started to sort of come back, became a bit more popular. So that people started thinking that, well, maybe carbon isn't the only sort of thing. And then around that time, the social media and the glass started to sort of come on the scene. And so suddenly it was, it was an alternative. And it, you know, it, it is, it is really good stuff. I say, as I said earlier, if I was in this position, if I was just looking at small streams for the first time now, glass is just, it is a really good material and the the range of manufacturers you know sort of McFarlane, Stephen Brothers who have been going for I don't know how long donkey's years and sort of the traditional stuff or traditional makers but then CTS as well with you know the unidirection and all the rest of it it's there is a really good choice and they are really they are really nice rods I got to admit you know there is a seven foot four glass it's a real sweet spot for for the material. I don't know what Adam's sort of thoughts on longer. You know, I think it's the length of the rods are similar. Eight foot glass, still nice, but starting to, the materials are starting to come into play a bit. I've got very little experience of glass single handers over sort of, yeah, over eight foot. I've, I've cast old glass, eight foot six rods. And they're definitely all they're definitely old school glass, but you know the modern ones. Yeah, on small streams, it is it's a really nice material. There's no and the cost, you know, they're a lot cheaper. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Adam, um, would you tend to agree seven foot for a four weight is a good place to start for somebody thinking about um, a glass rod? I definitely agree agree with Luke. I mean, over eight foot, even with the modern stuff, to me, it doesn't feel like you've still got that. You haven't got the the advantages of the material anymore. Um, I've cast nine foot five weights in the new stuff, and it, it's not. It, you can use it, but you're just thinking should probably have a carbon rod, really. <laughs> um, but yeah, seven foot four. I think a seven foot four is just a, a brilliant all round rod. It's versatile. You can just about get away with it on small streams, like the small streams I fish where there's tree canopies around you. Um, you can get away with it on bigger rivers, like the ones in Wales, like probably the Usk and things like that. Um, although ideally you'd have longer, but you could get away with it. It's just a, a nice all round, all round size. Um, I Most of my fishing is done between six and seven foot um but just purely because of for trout anyway for the the streams i fish um that's what suits best i do drop that i've got a, a five foot uh well that's going back to cane again but five foot bamboo that i use as well on the smallest smallest stream i fish but um yeah generally between six and probably seven and a half that's sort of the sweet spot for the the glass uh for me anyway and Adam, the colours are awesome as well. <laughs> they are, yeah, yeah. I'm sure a lot of people buy them just for that, but um, yeah, it's it, it's it's one of those things, isn't it? But um, I don't want the colours and how it looks to take away from the actual rods, because as Luke's saying, they're brilliant. They're they're every bit as good as anything else um, in certain applications. Um, Obviously, I still lean towards the bamboo side. I'd still choose a bamboo rod, but <laughs> cool. Luke, I know on one of our breakfasts before a day's grayling fishing, we talked about, and I think we touched on. Um, I cast a vision two hander 
which did you cast it? Were you that same thing at the? I can't remember if you were or not, but I cast it, and it was absolutely fantastic. And I could kind of see me wanting to fish one of those. Have you sort of experienced those? Have you cast those, or have you tried any? Is it what glass? Yeah. I don't think I have, to be honest. What's, can you remember what length it was? It was a 12-footer, eight weights, I think it was. Oh, no. Carl, don't ring a bell. No, no, it's a, it was really interesting to the degree it wasn't what I thought it would be, given those longer lengths, and I get that for single-handers, but for a double-handed rod, I was amazed and you know, fishing smaller patterns or traditional patterns or whatever, it it felt like it had a place and was a really interesting rod to cast. Um, and I don't know if there are many people, I suspect that is a niche of a niche within a niche somewhere or other, but I was really surprised how pleasing it was to cast smooth, um, didn't feel flatter. It just was really lovely. You know, I really enjoyed it. I was just interested to know um, whether you'd tried that. And I, I wonder if there is out, probably, I suspect it'll be more either in Europe or the US with steel headers or whatever, if there are people using those. Do you know if people make um, double hand glass rods? They do. I have done them. It's the, I mean, the vision one sounds like they're using the modern, you know, the modern glass, modern tapers, and so I've produced, I can see how it would, I can see how you could make a really nice glass, you know, small double hander. I've done them. They were, it was for someone who really just wanted to try. They, they were a guide, knew what, I'd say definitely knew what they were doing in terms of rods and things. Someone had asked them about glass and they didn't know. And they said, only one way to find out. So I made one up for them. And it was definitely an older style glass, you know, fairly through action, fairly slow. But you could see he, he was like, mm, yeah, that's not an, an everyday fishing rod, but sort of a daytime sea trout, you know, double hander on the bigger river, bigger rivers in Wales lovely you know it, it's those things that some of the rods you couldn't necessarily call them bad rods but they become much more specific in their use you know whereas a personally a really good rod is like adam was saying earlier that you can use in a lot of places a lot of situations that's on <laughs> this probably isn't a good thing for someone who sells fishing rods to say but I think you're much better off having one rod that you know inside out, that you fish in all sorts of conditions and you know exactly how it's going to work, whatever, you know, whatever the conditions you're going to come across, rather than having six different rods that, you know, some of them you only use once or twice a year in bad conditions. You're not really going to be that familiar with it. I'll say that. <laughs> that's probably not a good business model, but that's my, my, that's my sort of thing is, when someone's sort of talking about rods or, you know, coming to me for rods, my generally, I say, what's, what's most of your fishing? You know, what's most of your fishing going to be? Get the rod that does that best. And then, okay, other times it'll be a bit of a compromise, but it'll still be fine rather than yeah, trying to sort of get loads of different things to fix. Because I think the more, the more specific the rod, okay, it'll brilli be brilliant when it's doing that one thing. But as soon as you take it outside of that comfort zone, it's going to be a bit, it's just hard work, which yeah. I don't want to be working hard enough fishing, you know. Yeah. It's supposed to be fun, right? Well, exactly. Yeah, that's where we go. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that was really interesting chatting about the gloves, but I know Adam's alluded to it a few times and Luke too and me. Let's get on to bamboo. <laughs> Adam? sum it up for me what is it that ticks your box for bamboo what is it makes you passionate what makes you 
want to build those rods? What makes you want to fish them? What is it you love so much about them? Um, to be honest, I was listening to the last podcast or maybe a couple of weeks ago now, depending when this goes out, with um, Andy Baird, Small Fly Funk. And you were talking about the, was it um, the South Creek rod that you had, the, the Mike Payne? Mike Clark. And um, hearing you talk about that, yeah, um, um, hearing you talk about that is is basically the reason why I like making them. Um, it's and fishing them. I mean, until you've got a fish on a on a cane rod, you can't say you don't like it because it's, there's nothing else like it. If if I go fishing, I'm using glass, carbon, whatever. No matter what I'm fishing for, I'm fly fishing for pike, fly fishing for bass. Whenever I catch a fish, I always think, "God, oh, I wish I caught that on cane." Uh, that's that's just the the feeling it, it it gets. It's as Luke was saying as well. We go fishing because it's fun, um, and it just makes fishing more fun. It might not be the best material to use in certain situations, but if you do use it in those situations you're normally rewarded it's just uh, i don't <laughs> that's the best way i can sum it up it, it's just the best um and certainly on the small stream stuff that i do there's no the downsides to cane i suppose you could argue is cost and weight on the small stream stuff the weight is negligible because the rod's so sh short anyway it, you, you can't really you're not double hauling it all day long. It, it doesn't make your arm ache. Um, cost obviously is a factor, but I, I make them. So it's, <laughs> that's pretty much why I started making them, I suppose. So I didn't have to buy them. And I think that's a, uh, interesting thing. You talk about cost and I look at things at cost per use, but also if I buy one of your rods, either of yours or anyone else, they don't go down in value. So they're not going to, it's not like the new car syndrome or perhaps in some cases a, a new carbon rod as well, that that will go drop in value. I suspect yours do not do that. They hold that price. So even though you've spent that money, you've got the enjoyment, you've supported a craftsman and you've got something that you're going to enjoy using for many, many years. And it is, you know, I hate to use the word investment in fishing because it is, as we've said, about fun. But you've also got something that isn't going to be worth half its value. So that what I guess I'm trying to say is after that initial outlay, your money's sort of there that you're you're enjoying it. And it's it's there for you to pass on the rod or or enjoy it as much as as you possibly can. So. I, I've, that's how I've always tried to justify the, the rods, not as investments, of course, but as something that I can enjoy. And it's been made by people like yourselves that gives me great pleasure and I feel a connection with. And I've come back very strongly towards um, fishing bamboo again, given the, the last lockdown. It's always been there. And I know Luke we met over a, a shared love of, of bamboo and started talking about stuff and then fishing together. And I've been fortunate enough to have some of your rods as well that uh, I, I enjoy fishing with thoroughly. And what I wanted to get was a sense from you, Luke, as well, that what does it mean to you? And I know for Adam, it was a difficult one to sum up because it is, it's a difficult one if you haven't experienced it yourself. But how would you, for somebody who's bamboo curious, um, how, what, what does it mean to you? And, and can you explain that? Probably not very elegantly. <laughs> it's, it's a tricky one. It's, I think Adam hit it on the head. Is, until you look a trout on a cane rod, you're not going to get the the real benefit. It is extraordinary. Is I, I can remember this, the the Garrison two hundred one with this, this seven foot cane rod. It's sort of a it was an interesting rod for me because it sort of came about. I've been making rods for a while just for my own sort of benefit, and. Uh, 
the technique was starting to come together. So they were starting to get more accurate, more as they should be. The, the understanding the tapers was beginning to sort of come together. I'd heard it was, it wasn't pre-internet, but it was the internet was only just sort of there or thereabouts. I'd heard of Garrison a couple of times in articles and sort of heard that his rods were something special. So uh, actually Manny went to the library and used the internet there and downloaded the tapers for a 201 and made it and it sort of came out pretty close to dimension so it was quite a good it was probably one of the first time that everything had come together and fished on the local river and had about a, i don't know nine ten inch brownie on it and it it's extraordinary that that thing of hooking the fish and the fit the amount of feel that you get through cane it's yeah there isn't anything like it there's the aesthetics are nice and all of the rest of it but actually using and fishing with it that's really what it's that's what it's about you know is for me if if i wasn't making cane rods for a living i'd be making cane rods for myself you know that's it is it's a fascinating fascinating process and i guess my background was furniture making so it was sort of yeah my background was using my hands and then sort of going into the cane rods was a yeah it was sort of a natural progression almost but the yeah the the i don't want to use the word or the term the love of it because i couldn't really say i love it you know is it, it's just it's something extraordinary you know and it's something a, a real i get for want of a better term a connection you know just the whole sort of process uh, an interesting i guess from a because as makers we're going to have a completely different perspective on a cane rod than someone else because i've said to a few people that's gone down in different ways that they're, they're all my rods all the rods even though i've sold them it's still my rod you know it's my name on it it's still my, i don't own it or anything but they're my rods you know so when i see them it's my i'm still seeing my rod you know i've still got that connection so when i see someone at a show or something and they start talking about they had a fantastic day up on the dove or something and how much they enjoyed using it that's you know yeah that's my that's i'm i'm part well you I should imagine same for you or same for a guide putting someone on a fish you know maybe on a difficult day you know where there's a fish likely to be a bit of an awkward cast for the customer customer makes a good cast you know fly comes up takes it everything connects you know it's how do you sort of get that across that that sort of connection which yeah, yeah it's, it is a difficult one to Put, and when you asked Adam first, I thought, well, this will be interesting. See, see what he says about trying to describe, describe the sort of the, the connection with Kane. There's the other one, which was, it surprised me, was I was delivering a rod. We met up on Dartmoor, days fishing, which is a lovely place to fish Kane. Stopped for a cup of tea. And the chap was just sort of sitting there and just enjoying Dartmoor, really. And there, uh, he sort of went a bit quiet or just a bit thoughtful or was a bit quiet and of course as, as as the maker you think oh does he like it has he got has he noticed something on the rod you know so just sort of oh you're all right and uh, he said yeah he said i've just realized he said that rod or that thing is the only thing i own where i've actually met the person that made it and i thought oh that's an interesting sort of thing and it, it stayed with me, well, it stayed with me all the time because it is building a rod for someone. There is definitely a, I can call it a connection, but there is definitely a, an interaction, yeah, that sort of goes on for a long time. You know, I'm sure Adam's had it where you, you know, bumping into old customers at shows and things. It is a, an interesting part of the, of the process, really. So, yeah, but in terms of why I love Kane, it's just great.
That's a good enough answer for me. That's a good enough one. My, I made no secret of the fact that my entry into it was when I first read Trout Bum many, many years ago now, and that was it. And that started that passion for me that has always remained incredibly strong. Adam, do you find that um, people are coming into it along a similar route that they may have read Girak and said, yeah, I get what he's on about. I'd like to experience that myself. I think certainly it's more a, a curiosity, probably as well, driven by social media and, and magazines like Play Culture as well that include um, certain things about it. Um, certainly from the customers I've had, they they just want to try it because they've heard such good things about it. Um, myself, I the first fishing rod I ever had when I was like five years old or whatever was a, a garden cane that my dad made me with a lashed a bit of line on to fish um, for gobies and blennies in rock pools in Cornwall. Um, and then obviously I fished as I grew up and started course fishing and things. And um, I was watching a lot of go fishing, John Wilson, and then passion for angling, Chris Yates and Bob James. And that's kind of what started me off on that path. So I started buying cane rods off eBay actually um and using them for course fishing and that's where i sort of found how different they are how nice they are once you actually catch fish um so then when i came into fly fishing the first thing i did was buy i think it was a nine foot five weight scotty rod off ebay and i was using it to catch chub and dace and um on the dry fly and it was horrible to use, but once you actually hooked a fish, it was that same feeling. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of what got me into it. For other people, like I said, I think it's just um, it's just a, a curiosity to experience it. And I always say to people that come to me, I say, even if you don't buy one of my rods, buy a modern rod, handmade rod, and um, you won't regret it. It's... Um, they're completely different from the rods of old and they're just the best. <laughs> I've got a um, Scotty's in 88. Yeah. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. It's an eight and a half foot five weight, something like that, which did, that was the first one I bought to try it. And then, you know, subsequently went down other routes from there, but um, that was quite interesting. But I still, as you say, when I played the fish, I got what it was about. And it is a really difficult one, and it was a difficult question for both of you, I know, but it is a difficult one to explain, isn't it? But it does um, make people... It, it's. I find it hard to describe to people. The word, I think, again, coming back to Girac, and apologies for that, but I think he uses the word organic, and I think that's there is a, a and the word you used again loop connection as well and you feel closer to your environment and uh around that's around you and i think there's an element of that for me too and yeah i'm finding more so and more so that that's the the route i'm going for my st small stream fishing now um if luke i asked you what would be and i know you make a both of you make a, a number of different rods i'll give you two give me two that would sum your rods up in in bamboo rods it <laughs> i guess the first would be the seven foot four weight super fast that's the sort of my probably the standard but probably the most popular rod that i do the second one Funny enough, it would probably be six foot ten, which is almost the same rod, but the Leonard, which is similar, is I'd say the, the super fast is a modern, really based on modern sort of tapers, modern cast and this strokes, sort of trying to get similar, I won't say similar to carbon, but more suitable to a modern casting stroke, which generally are a bit faster and a bit sharper. 
for Leonard is a sort of a fast traditional, which is just a stunning. It's it's the only role I don't own, is because people keep buying them. They're just it's just a really nice, smooth casting. Yeah, just an absolutely gorgeous rod. And I think that's the thing with the, the traditional rods. There are the old, like we were saying about the old cane, that just pretty much the same action all the way through. You know, just the whole rod just sort of bends and slow, and they have a certain feel that some people like, but an awful lot of people don't. But there are some really good, faster, traditional tapers that are just phenomenal, you know, just absolutely, well, then that's why they're still around. I think that's the nice thing now. A lot of tapers, all, all the tapers are online. All the good ones people are using, you know, the ones that if it wasn't a very nice rod, people wouldn't measure it. You know, they wouldn't take the dimension, so they aren't really there. But the, yeah, a lot of the modern or the, the traditional tapers that are still around really nice i mean it, a lot of it comes down to personal choice as well you know that's the thing is what one person likes another person might not like at all but no i it, i would have liked to when i give you two rods i'd have liked to have given you two completely different rods but actually they're, they're both about seven foot four weight <laughs> Okay, this uh, you're, you've had a chance, I guess, Adam, to think about this this answer. So, sh shoot me a couple that um, you think um, show you, or your favourites that you build. Uh, so probably rather predictably, the first one's going to be a seven foot four weight, <laughs> um, which is the, from like my Monarch signature range. Um, again, it's just developed from old tapers that we tried out back in the day. Um, and obviously we tend to put the mortise butt on the, instead of just swelling the cane to sort of stop the action through the handle, we um, we put a mortise in them, which is like inlaying other pieces of wood basically to make it look uh, a bit fancier, I suppose. Um, but yeah, that stops the action. It sort of makes it a bit more tippy, a bit less through, um, but also it's, for cane anyway fast um and yeah that that rod is it's a beast it can throw a whole line if you want or you can cast to sort of sort of nice 10 yard cast or something like that um not 10 yard cast 10 foot cast if you wanted on a small stream um other than that my other favorite is probably the five foot three weight um that i do Again, this two piece or one piece, probably the one piece is my favorite, um, although it's a bit of a pain to lug around. Um, but it's worth it. As soon as you get it on one of those small streams where you're stood sort of up to your chest, the limit of your waders, the tree canopies right over you, and you're still thinking, car, this rod's a bit too long, one of those. But it's just brilliant. You can sort of cast it level with the, just above the water like that. Um, you just get in all those spots where you couldn't possibly fish otherwise and that's sort of the place where i tend to enjoy my fishing the most um and that rod is, is smooth it'll roll cast but it's still quite quick um yeah they're the two i'd pick definitely a bit different <laughs> seven foot and a five footer but yeah and that three um three and four weight sweet spot nice nice well, that's been really interesting to hear about those. Um, what I was thinking was also the, the, the building process. And, you know, you, you've touched on it, both of you, about when somebody puts the order in and you see them at shows subsequently. You build that sort of relationship that far outlives me walking into a tackle shop and buying a rod. I guess that's part of that personal service that you supply um when you're building that rod though there must be it's it's kind of interesting because i'm just sort of it sounds a bit poetic and it's not meant to be but i guess there's part of your souls going into that as you build it i can imagine you in your workshops building those rods and then 
that handover, it's sort of kind of, in some respects, like buying a piece of art from an artist. And I think it's it's similar in that sense that, you know, you're there throughout that process, the person you're building for is in their thoughts, because I know, um, Luke, and I'm sure you're the same, Adam, you sort of talk to people about what they want and what they want to get from a rod. Um, is that in your mind when you're building that and that moment when you hand it over, Luke, as well? Is that a sort of a special moment too? It's uh, handing the rods over a tricky one, really. It's in a way it's a relief or, you know, it's sort of, it's the end of a process and there's always a, are they going to like it? Is it going to be what they were expecting? You know, there's, it's, yeah, it's a tricky one. I, I'd say it, it's difficult and also to say when the process actually ends. I guess that's the thing, is it, because, all right, the building is the process of building it, but then there is still the sort of the thing of, you know, making sure that the person has got what they want, understands what they're getting. It's, yeah, it's a bit like, why do you like a cane rod? <laughs> why do you like a cane rod? It, I, yeah, it's, yeah, it's difficult to say when the, that process starts and ends, really. And it is, I say, handing rods over is a tricky one, you know, because you, thankfully, it doesn't happen very often, but sometimes you do get customers that are a bit awkward, you know, for whatever reasons, whether it's reasons from my side or, you know, it can be sometimes that the customers are just problematic, you know, that's part of the any sort of commercial process, there's going to be elements to it that don't always run smoothly so it's sort of i think it's nice once they've had it for a while and been fishing with it you know once they've had it and fish with it for a few times and then when if you contact them or if you're in contact with them six months when they've had it for six months that's when it's you get a it's nice to see them then <laughs> you know, if they phone you if the phone rings if they've had it for a week and you see the number on the telephone and it's ringing it, my the my thought process is oh i hope it's all right you know it's not oh this is fantastic it's why are they phoning me you know is it are they phoning yeah. up to say i've just had the best days fishing on my river i absolutely love it or are they saying oh this isn't really what i was expecting you know so it's not a as in a way i guess well that is part of the process there's no <laughs> you can't get away from it uh, yeah yeah because yeah. i guess adam it must be kind of interesting as you say that phone call afterwards or if you happen to meet them because i guess the risk sometimes um could be that somebody's ordered a bamboo rob without ever casting one and and i know you guys would have advised them through that process but the, i guess there is a chance that people suddenly think oh actually it's not what i was expecting in that sense and it must be so pleasing when you do hear as luke says and you get that phone call from somebody saying i've just taken it out i love it and that almost relief but i guess there's a pride there too isn't there there is definitely yeah and, and i completely understand what luke's saying you never know what the phone call is going to say but I've, I've never had anyone not touch wood um never had anyone say it's not what they wanted or not what they expected um whether they're just being polite i don't know but um it's never come back to me anyway but the what i really like seeing these days um obviously with social media and everything you can see pictures of them being used every week on social media on instagram or something um and it's it's really rewarding to know that that's happening and people are enjoying them and doing what I wanted them to do with it, even though it's their rod, if you see what I mean. Um, Cause yeah, I, I don't make rods for them to be hung on a wall or anything. Um, they're all users. Um, so yeah, when they're being used and people are happy with them and you see them at shows when they used to happen anyway. Um, yeah, it's, it's really rewarding. And to know that the rod might even outlast you and be passed down 
some people ask for their children's name to be put on the rod, um, which I always think is really nice because they're already thinking they want to pass it on. So, you know, it's it's there for the long term, you know. Um, and it's, it's again, it's another reason why I make them. I, I enjoy that part of it. Um, yeah, just don't enjoy the phone calls where a real seat's fallen off or something like that, which has happened once. I'll, I'll admit that. Cool. Cool. It's been fascinating learning a little bit about inside your thought process for these things. I know people can look up if they want to um, learn some more about bamboo rods or cane rods. I'll, I'll fire this one. I think I've asked you this before, Luke. And again, because of my influences, I call them bamboo, bamboo or cane. Really don't mind. Really don't mind. Yeah, I'll probably call them cane. Yeah, I'll probably call them cane rods. But who's likely to call them bamboo? Someone who's been listening to this will probably tell us what <laughs> what we've been using. But no, I don't really. It's all the same, you know. It is, yeah. 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 Adam. Yeah. Uh, I I definitely say cane, but I'm very aware of the fact that I've probably <laughs> said bamboo more often in this podcast. So, um, yeah. Either or, really, but it's yeah. probably cane. That's my bad influence. So apologies for that. Gentlemen, this has been fascinating talking with you. I think we've been going well over an hour now, and I think we could keep going and keep going. But um, what I wanted to do was if somebody has listened to this and would like to get in touch with you, um, how would they do that, Adam, if they wanted to get in touch with you and talk about um, carbon, glass, or bamboo rods? Oh, sorry, cane rods. <laughs> Um, just visit the website rawsonfishing.co.uk um, or look me up on Instagram, Twitter, same same thing, just Rawson Fishing. Lovely. Just, uh, and Luke, how can people get hold of you? Uh, basically the same. Email is probably as good as any, but the website's splitcane.co.uk. Just as a, um, I'm sure Adam as well, well, and you are, we're happy to talk about fishing rods. And that's to get the... If someone's looking to get a fishing rod, the best thing is just talk to someone, talk to them. And the nice thing now, there's makers that you can talk to. You know, there's different people, phone up or email and just have a chat. Go from there. Fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you so much for such an interesting chat about so many different subjects and being so transparent about them all. It's been really interesting hearing about everything and and chatting about everything so i'd like to thank you both for being such great guests on the fly culture podcast thanks for having us <laughs> thanks thank for you having gents us. very much indeed i hope you've enjoyed this podcast as much as me um like i say have a look at these guys website as well because the stuff that they're doing i think is really fantastic and it's a little bit different and in the world that we're living right now it's these fascinating um, boutique builders that are just doing wonderful, interesting stuff, high quality that, you know, I've used and, and love myself. And I, I hope um, you'll learn a little bit as well from this about the passion of two guys who are building quality products. So um, thank you so much for listening to the Fly Culture podcast. As ever, there will be plenty more coming. Um, please, if you've been enjoying these, um, leave us a review. Um, subscribe to the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, as well, for the messages that you send. They really do mean a lot to me. And as you know, I always make sure I, I reply to them. But I really do appreciate it. So thank you for listening to this very latest Fly Culture podcast. <laughs>